In this video, we'll pick up where we left off from using the grid expectations init command and use the create expectations notebook to create our first expectation suite. We saw at the end of the init the local site, which we were just looking at a moment ago, and we can now go ahead and look at the uh, create expectations notebook by launching it in Jupyter. The notebook walks us through the process of getting a batch of data from a data context and uh, building expectations. The data context object represents all the configuration that we just set up during init. And we can use the Jupyter UX module to make interacting with great expectations in an interactive notebook a little bit easier. So for example, by listing the available data asset names, we can see our data source generator, generator asset, and the expectation suite that was just created when we profiled our data. Now, in our case, we know that this uh, data is called the uh, NPI data. So we can uh, put that in as our data asset name and uh, we'll normalize that name. Now, when we normalize the name, Great Expectations uh, recognizes because this particular name is unambiguous that the fully qualified name in our data source generator and generator asset includes uh, the data dir and default generator components as well. We recommend that the first custom expectation suite that you create for a given data asset is usually called warning, recognizing the fact that most likely the first expectations we create are useful for warning and uh, that additional expectation suites will have more tailored purposes such as failing a pipeline that's running in production environment. Now, we'll next create a new expectation suite to hold the expectations that we're creating right now. Now that expectation suite uh, is going to have the name and be part of the data asset that we just created. Um, and we'll use it throughout this uh, notebook and then save it at the end. To load a batch of data, we use three parts. We use the data asset name, we use the expectation suite name, and we use a definition of the specific batch from that data asset that we want. There are a variety of different ways to construct the batch quarks or definition of that batch. The easiest, when especially you're working in a file context, is just to yield batch quarks using the context for that data asset name, which just gets the next batch available. So uh, we'll go ahead and get that batch and take a look at the data that are loaded in. Uh, we have the 329 columns from this National Provider Identifier data set from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States. And um, as we observed in profiling, a lot of the data uh, is null, but we have the type codes and um, contact information for these doctors here. We can take a look at the batch quarks that were used to generate that batch, and we'll notice that there are several interesting things here. So we have the path from which this particular file was read. We also have a partition ID, as well as some additional metadata that was used during the process of reading it. So for example, if we needed to specify a custom separator or header names or column types, that can be present during the definition of the batch. At the same time, there's a batch ID that's added to the batch that reflects the output from generating the batch. So these are things like the timestamp or a fingerprint of the actual data. Together, these give us a really robust way of understanding the data that we are operating on. Now it's time to actually build some expectations. We can build expectations by calling the expect methods right on the batch that we just got. So first let's take a look at this batch of data and we'll just say that we expect the values in that first column, in our case that's the actual NPI column, to not be null. When we run the expectation, it's immediately evaluated and we get information that it was successful uh, there were 18,000 approximately elements, all of which were in the expected values. Now for this one, we can add um, a variety of different expectations. And we'll notice that in Jupyter, we can autocomplete on the expect name in order to see available expectations. By switching back to the profiling, let's take a look at this uh, provider other organization name type code. It's an interesting column for us to quickly glance at, and, and we'll make an expectation um, about that. So we'll expect the column 
distinct values for that column to be in a particular set. Now, notice that the values, uh, we did not observe any ones or twos. So we see a zero, three, four, and five. So we'll, we'll uh, based on our profiling results and most likely, of course, in consultation with others who are using this data, expect that those are, are gonna be the values uh, that we name. Now, it looks like I got my column name wrong. But when I uh, correct that, I see that is indeed true, uh, but that most of the values are missing. Let's create an expectation about that. Um, let's say that we expect now that the uh, column values will be null. And we expect that um, at least 90% of the time. Now, in this case, uh, it, it's true, and the complement of that uh, missing percent is what's unexpected. So 5.6% of these values are null, but our expectation is true. Now that we've added a couple of expectations, of course, we could add uh, more. Let's take a look at what has been added. So we can see the same information about our data asset name, expectation suite name. And we now see a uh, JSON representation of the expectations that we just made, that we expected the NPI column not to be null. We expected the provider other organization name type code to have values of zero, three, four, or five, and that at least 90% of the values in the provider other organization name type code column will be missing. That looks right, so let's go ahead and save that expectation suite. Great, the next thing we'll do is look at integrating validation into our pipeline.